Hello and welcome to The Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Charles Anyagolo. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, President Biden lays out his ideas for American foreign policy, putting U.S. global leadership as the centerpiece of his international agenda and signaling a change in direction for the country. Moments after delivering that foreign policy speech, Mr. Biden promised to rebuild America's partnership with the African Union, which took a big hit under his predecessor, Donald Trump, culminating in a row over Mr. Trump's alleged use of the word asshole to describe African nations. So how different will the Biden administration's African policy be to that of President Trump's? Is Africa now fully back on the White House political agenda? Well, my guest today should know she was for several years the U.S. ambassador to Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the African Union. Ambassador Rene Robin Sanders, coming up. So, President Biden outlining a sweeping vision of restored American global leadership based, he said, on alliances and values. In his first foreign policy speech, he said he intended to send a clear message to the world that American diplomacy is back. And among the major policies, such as vowing to confront Russia and China, but also working with them when possible, Mr. Biden put a reassuring focus on one neglected alliance, Africa. Speaking moments after delivering that much anticipated foreign policy speech at the State Department, the President sent a message directly to the African Union ahead of its 34th summit, promising to rebuild America's partnership with the continent and to re-engage with the AU. Take a listen. Hello, everyone. I'm honored to send the best wishes of the people of the United States in advance of the 34th African Union Summit. This past year has shown us how interconnected our world is and how our fates are bound up together. That's why my administration is committing to rebuilding our partnership around the world and re-engaging with international institutions like the African Union. We must all work together to advance our shared vision of a better future. A future of growing trade and investment that advances prosperity for all our nations. A future that advances lives of peace and security for all our citizens. A future committed to investing in our democratic institutions and promoting the human rights of all people. Women and girls, LGBTQ individuals, people with disabilities, and people of every ethnic background, religion, and heritage. To reach this future, we also must confront the serious challenges we face. That includes investing more in global health, defeating COVID-19, and working to prevent, detect, and respond to future health crises, and partnering with the African CDC and other institutions to advance health security. Raising our climate ambitions and ensuring developing nations can mitigate and adapt to climate impacts that are already causing pain and engaging in sustained diplomacy in connection with the African Union to address conflicts that are costing lives all across the African continent. None of this is going to be easy, but the United States stands ready now to be your partner in solidarity, support, and mutual respect. We believe in the nations of Africa, in the continent-wide spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation, and through the challenges ahead, although they're great, there is no doubt that our nations, our people, the African Union, were up to this task. I hope I can be with you next time in person. I want to thank you, though. Thank you. May God bless you all. President Joe Biden reaching out to the African Union there. Well, to get some reaction now from my guest today, Ambassador Rene Robin Sanders is the former U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, the DR Congo, the African Union and ECOWAS. She's currently the CEO of Feeds Advocacy Initiative, an organization that focuses on African development and on business strategies for the continent. And Ambassador Sanders joins me now from Washington. Thank you very much indeed for 
joining us. Uh, you, you've got a very long CV there, and I'm afraid I had to cut it short a bit. But later in the program, we're going to talk a lot more about you, what you've done, and what you're doing now. But I want to first of all get your assessment of that speech made uh, some 24 hours ago or so by Joe Biden um, setting out his foreign policy initiatives uh, and also reaching out to Africa. Let's first of all talk about the global picture. You are of course a former career diplomat. What will the world make of President Biden's world view? Uh, uh, well, I guess good afternoon, good morning here, and thank you for having me on the show. I think that it was clear in the speech uh, yesterday, uh, there is really was a twofold speech. It was a speech addressed um, as a domestic speech with foreign policy elements, I think is what how I would view it, uh, because I think there is a big effort now uh, with the Biden administration to make uh, general Americans across the nation understand that our foreign policy and our domestic well-being are interconnected. And I do think uh, as a result of uh, the last uh, administration, uh, you have about 74 million people who don't see that eye to eye. And I think that the speech being both domestically focused and foreign policy focused was very, very important. The fact that we have to be back on diplomacy, that diplomacy has to be front and center of our message on democracy, on our engagement in every sector, whether it's climate change, whether it's helping our friends and allies with security. All of that is key not only to our relationships abroad, but it's also key to our well-being here in the United States. And so I thought it was a very well-crafted speech because it really brought together the two challenges that we have here in the U.S., but it also, I think, reassured our friends, particularly on the continent, that we are back. We are back on health. We are back on democracy. We are back on climate change. We're back as a global partner. We're back on global engagement. And we look forward to working with our partners and friends on all of the issues that he outlined and the ones that I just mentioned. Well, thank you very much indeed for uh, setting all that out. Um, I, I was just going to get your, because I mean, you're a very experienced diplomat. You were a career diplomat, and I mean, you have a very good knowledge of what happens internationally. Will there be some unease on the global level? Because everyone knows how divided America is still. And they also know the scale of the problems facing President Biden. I think that there should be some comfort in the fact that the stage has been set. And you have an incredible team behind uh, President Biden from the Secretary of State uh, to uh, the, the um, uh, designee for the United Nations and a number of other positions across the national security spectrum. So I think that there should be some comfort in that. I also think there should be some comfort in that we are back on our commitment to our word. I think that we have at a time that if we said something, people were unsure whether number one, we would deliver, and number two, whether we would be committed to what we said. And I think that that's all changed, um, you know, in, in the presence of, of what President Biden has said, but also knowing him as a person. He is a career politician. Uh, he has as this nation on many occasions. And I think that there's comfort in knowing that you have a man at the helm like President Biden that is committed to his word. I think that he's been in office just about a little over two weeks. I think the, the number of things that he has done in that short period of time is extraordinary, uh, particularly back into, our, into some of our global engagement areas. So I think there should be some comfort in that. Uh, the fact that we are a divided nation is is really a daunting task. I will tell you, I'm here in the Washington area, and it is it really is an unbe unbelievable environment, even for somebody as seasoned as I am. I do think that it's important that, um, you know, I used to keep, um, not used to keep, but when I was in uh, the diplomatic corps, I always kept the Constitution on my desk, and I have a copy of it here. And there is a phrase in the Constitution that I always uh, pull out when I get asked questions like that. It is really striving to be a more perfect 
which says that, you know, we know that we're not perfect, but we're going to continue to strive to be there. And I think that, uh, you know, our friends and allies uh, need to have comfort in the fact that you know, we're going to try to do those things. We're going to try to walk the walk and talk the talk and deliver on our promises. And the fact that we're going to put diplomacy front and center, I think should give our friends and allies comfort. On the African Union uh, remarks that he made, I think that you should uh, be comforted, particularly the continent, and the fact that there is a huge team around um, President Biden that knows the continent extremely well, including the Secretary of State, um, worked on African issues as well. So you have this huge um, intellectual property that's behind him that really not only knows Africa well, but really cares about the continent. So I think that was reflected in the speech uh, that remarks that he made to the African Union uh, yesterday as they began this weekend. Uh, there's, so I think that across the board, there should be comfort in the fact that, you know, we're here to stay, we're back, uh, we have good leadership, good direction, we're committed, we're engaged, and, um, and our diplomacy is going to be front and center in getting us there. Well, I mean, there is, of course, the added difficulty that there is some reticence amongst the international community because nobody knows what America is going to look like in four years. I mean, America's friends may wish Mr. Biden well, but there must always be that lingering desire to hedge their bets, um, that, you know, that, 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 ha that, that hesitation that perhaps a kind of Trumpism Mark II might return in four years' time. And we've got about a minute, so if I have to interrupt you, we'll come back and continue. Sure, I'll note the time. Um, I think no one has a crystal ball, uh, and certainly um, I think that what you need to do is give uh, President Biden to see what he can do to change the tide and the tenor of the nation. It's a daunting task, there's no question about that. Uh, but I think that no leader around the world has a crystal ball to, to, to determine what's going to happen in four years. So, you know, let's deal with the presence, present, the here and now, and let's work together to try to change that, not only domestically, but certainly the effort to re-engage with our partners and be engaged, I think, is paramount. Right. Okay. And, of course, um, we've seen so far the U.S. focusing more on Russia than China, but the relationship with China is much more complex, isn't it? And we've got about 30 seconds. Please. Okay, uh, you know, the two main things that uh, Americans who do, do pay attention to foreign policy on a, on a not necessarily a day-to-day -day basis, but sort of on an average basis, really see China and Russia as the big issues for the U.S. on foreign policy. I think Russia came a little bit yesterday because of the the things that are going on in Russia today, uh, right now, you know, the demonstrations, the, the jailing of opposition leaders and all of that. So that's kind of front and center. And then certainly, uh, you know, China is a big competitor. Uh, President Biden was very, very clear yesterday that the, you know, they are a competitor, full stop. There's okay. no way around that. However, it doesn't mean that we can't cooperate and engage in some okay. positive way. Well, well, we'll come back in a minute and we'll talk about your area of expertise, which is Africa. You're watching the Arise interview, plenty more still ahead, as we continue our chat with the former U.S. ambassador to Nigeria, DR Congo, ECOWAS, and the African Union, Rene Robin Sanders. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. So after grappling with the twin challenges of the pandemic and a divided nation, U.S. President Joe Biden has now turned his attention to America's place in the world. Speaking at the State Department, he left Americans and the world in no doubt that it was all change in Washington and a new re-engagement with Africa. Well, my guest today, Ambassador Renee Robin Sanders, knows all about that. She's a former Korea diplomat who served under President Obama when Joe Biden was his vice president. Dr. Sanders is the former U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria and DR Congo and was also the U.S. Diplomatic Envoy to the African Union as well as U.S. Ambassador to ECOWAS, the West African Regional Organization. 
She's currently the CEO of Feeds Advocacy Initiative, an organization that focuses on African development and on business strategies for Africa. She holds a doctorate degree in information systems and communications and is the recipient of six U.S. State Department awards as well as several African diaspora honors for her work with small business in Africa. She is the author of two books, The Rise of Small and Medium Size Enterprises Af in Africa and The Legendary Uli Women of Nigeria. So I have about eight sectors that I see where Africa SMEs have had this tremendous, tremendous impact. I'm just going to give you a few of them. Power, for instance. You have 600 million Africans without power on a daily basis, which means it has an impact on education and it has an impact on health. You have SMEs making inroads in that area by developing pay-as-you-go electricity plans through scratch cards. You have agricultural efforts through appropriate technology, looking at ways to do things differently where you don't have to import things to grow agriculture. You have making their own local machines so they're not importing big tractors to do farming. You have new technology in housing. Because guess what? If you're living in extreme poverty, you also have a challenge with shelter. And so the green technology that's out there. And then you have the wonderful things that are being done in textiles. You know, whether you're using recycled buttons to make necklaces to sell, whether you're making textiles for clothing, all of these things are causing the rise of, F of Africa SMEs and really the good news story. So what's the global impact? The region has a tremendous demographic impact that I think you need to know, particularly in these few areas. Population. The population of the continent is currently 1.1 billion people. 1.1 billion. It is on course to be 2.4 billion by 2050. More than half of that population will be under the age of 30, 600 million plus people in that category. The most staggering figure, which I call a population dividend, which is a positive, is the fact that in 2035, which is an international monetary figure, you will have Africa having the largest working population in the world combined. It will be bigger than the combined rest of the world. And Ambassador Robin Renee Sanders is still with me from Washington. And of course it is Robin Renee, not Renee Robin. So let's just be clear on that one. Thank you very much indeed for uh, staying with us. Um, just tell us a bit more about the work that you do now, having spent all that time as a career diplomat, as an ambassador, uh, several places across Africa. Um, tell us about the FEEDS initiative that you are CEO of. Yes, uh, what I decided to really focus on when I decided to leave the Corps 12 years early was to focus on the areas that I'm really passionate about development that I, I worked on um, throughout my career. And FEEDS is actually an acronym. And so those areas that I work on are represented in that acronym. So food security, uh, education, uh, and environment, because they're very much uh, connected. <clears throat> Pardon me. A democracy is the D and S is self-help. And so uh, I spend my time good bit of it in Nigeria before the, the uh, before COVID, clearly. But working on those issues uh, both globally uh, and also domestic with at-risk populations and, and students in particular. Uh, I have expanded a bit of my geographic uh, focus. Uh, I belong to an international human rights organization and we do a lot around the world, particularly in uh, Asia and Latin America. Uh, I was in Myanmar, uh, Burma, which is very much in the news uh, right now, looking at those issues that we see today, uh, you know, meeting with the Minister of Defense, uh, meeting with Rohingya activists at that time. Um, uh, also, uh, you know, last year being in, in uh, sorry, 2019, I apologize, uh, being in, uh, in Brazil, the same uh, development issues that I've just highlighted. So. That's kind of the focus of my energy and effort, um, and it keeps uh, it keeps the passion that I care about on those issues very much alive. And also, when I was ambassador in the Republic of the Congo, which is Brazzaville, um, 
uh, real interest in small and medium-sized enterprises uh, developed, and I've been working with SMEs uh, really since uh, the mid-2000s, actually, even though it's a term that's used more readily now in the last five or six years. I've been working with, on SME issues for uh, a very long time, hence the, the book that you highlighted. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Clearly, you've had, um, beyond your, your career as a diplomat, um, extensive experience in, in other areas that, that are related to, to the continent and the world. So, I mean, let, let's talk a little bit about U.S.-Africa policy and the question of whether the Biden-Harris administration is going to be different to Barack Obama's, for example, that you served under, and Donald Trump's. I mean, how different do you think their Africa policy will be? And do you expect that it's going to be better, for example, than what you had uh, as a diplomat under Barack Obama? I think there'd be some similarities. I mean, President Biden is clearly his own person. I think that that was, you know, it's been evident to all of us here, but certainly I think the speech yesterday provided an additional underscoring of that. And he will develop his own frame, his engagement with each region. But I do think the pillars will remain the same. I think the pillars of, of, of democracy, uh, the pillars of engagement, uh, the pillars of focusing on human rights, uh, we've added climate change back in. I think you and your audience probably knows that uh, most impacted regions of the world on uh, climate change uh, uh, are Africa and Latin America. And the two biggest polluters on cl climate change are the U.S. and China, uh, representing about 46 percent, uh, I believe, of greenhouse gases uh, a world of the world figure. So I and those elements, or I call them main pillars of democracy, I think we'll go back to those and we'll articulate them. But, you know, one thing you learn about diplomacy, uh, and particularly uh, uh, given um, uh, you know, my, the teams that I had the honor to work with across, across my career, is that you've got practical actions that people can see and touch and interact with on the ground. So. Where I see the change happening is not sort of much, not that much, pardon me, in the in the the words that are used per se, but sort of the implementation aspect of it. You know, how do you talk to somebody about democracy? Never experienced it. What does democracy actually mean on a day to day basis to somebody who is is not only hungry but also running from conflict? So how do you change those laudable concepts? into something that's practical that people can touch, feel, and that impacts and changes. So I see that changing. And I think the biggest thing is really the tone. I think that if you listen to the speech that he made to the African Union, um, uh, that you'll hear a difference in tone. And sometimes that civility, that tone of respect and understanding that provides a sense that yeah, we are here as partners with you, we're not here to dictate to you, I think will be the biggest value added that you will see coming out of the Biden administration. In addition to really having uh, professionals that really know the continent well, and as I said earlier in your broadcast, it really the continent and the people of Africa. Okay, please stay with us. We want to talk with you some more. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the former U.S. ambassador to Nigeria, DR Congo, ECOWAS, and the African Union, uh, Robin Renee Sanders. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anya Golden. My guest today, Ambassador Robin Renee Sanders, is the former U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, DR Congo, ECOWAS, and the African Union. She's a former Korea diplomat who served under President Obama and his then Vice President Joe Biden. 
Mr. Biden is now, of course, president, and Ambassador Sanders is helping us assess Mr. Biden's promise to rebuild his country's partnership with the African Union. You may recall that President Biden's predecessor, Donald Trump, sparked a row in 2018 over his alleged use of the word S-hole to describe African nations. Earlier, the White House tweeted a video of President Biden's remarks to the African Union ahead of its 34th summit. He promised to re-engage with the AU and affirmed his commitment to rebuilding America's partnership with not just Africa, but the world. America is back. America is back. Diplomacy is back at the center of our foreign policy. As I said in my inaugural address, we will repair our alliances and engage with the world once again, not to meet yesterday's challenges, but today's and tomorrow's. American leadership must meet this new moment of advancing authoritarianism, including the growing ambitions of China to rival the United States and the determination of Russia to damage and disrupt our democracy. We must meet the new moment accelerating, glo accelerating global challenges from the pandemic to the climate crisis to nuclear proliferation, challenging the will only to be solved by nations working together and in common. We can't do it alone. If we invest in ourselves and our people, if we fight to ensure that American business is our position to compete and win on the global stage, if the rules of international trade aren't stacked against us, if our workers and intellectual property are protected, then there's no country on Earth, not China or any other country on Earth, that can match us. Investing in our diplomacy isn't something we do just because it's the right thing. That's uh, President Biden there talking a little bit about domestic uh, stuff. We are, of course, much more interested in the global side of things, particularly Africa, and helping us assess all that. Ambassador Robin Renee Saunders, who is still with me from Washington. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us and for giving us the benefit of your extensive experience as a diplomat and as a friend of Africa. Does the U.S. have a genuine interest in helping Africa on issues such as economic development and governance? Uh, and, and if so, is it important for the Biden administration to communicate that quickly to the continent? I thought that elements of his remark sort of touched on that. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm looking forward to seeing is... Uh, you know, who will be uh, at the sub-cabinet level as the top daily diplomat on Africa, and that title is, is the Assistant Secretary of State for Africa. Uh, there is uh, a wealth of, of academics and lawyers and, and, uh, and uh, current foreign service officers uh, who have worked in know Africa well. And I do think that uh, within that cadre of, of, of intellectual property, uh, that's there, that um, there is a real commitment to work on these things. The, the, when I talked earlier about what I do on feeds and why I wanted to sort of step back and only focus on those areas, is uh, I believe that on the development side in particular, uh, and some of those development issues drive conflict, as we all know. Uh, and so I think a focus on development and how you translate those themes of democracy into actual actions on the ground. I think that's fundamental uh, to be able to underscore that not only are we saying the right things, but that we're doing the right things on the ground. And I do have to give uh, my diplomatic colleagues a, a huge nod. I mean, despite uh, you know all of the ups and downs here in Washington, uh, you know they steadfastly held on the the main pillars of our policy over the last two decades on focusing on democracy programs, on food security programs, on health programs, uh, on engagement, even with the limits and the difficulty of sort of maneuvering through the landmines that were out there in doing so. Uh, I look forward to uh, the robustness coming back on those areas, but certainly uh, I've already talked about climate change and I keep stressing that because I think that climate change can drive or is driving some of these other, particularly on food security 
and, uh, and particularly on conflict, because you have uh, tensions being pushed right up against each other, other when resources, whether it be water or food or shelter or anything else, right up against each other, causing conflict on top of sort of the, the, uh, the terrorism of, of uh, certain countries uh, in terms of their particular regions that are un really under uh, a big strain in terms of conflict driven by terrorism as opposed to by climate change related issues. So I think turning our rhetoric into actual uh, engagement on the ground, I think is, is the way forward. And it's due and we just need to get back to, to doing that. I think you made some very interesting points there, one of them being the, that the, there ought to be a practicalization of democracy and good governance, because uh, Mr. Biden was pushed in his first Meet the Press, um, this online sort of press conference, he was pushed on intervention in Ethiopia and also the Ugandan election. And of course, the US gives a lot of money to Uganda and helps fight terrorism there. And yet there are these disputed elections recently. How difficult will it be for Mr. Biden to walk that line? I don't think it's difficult uh, for him to do that or for the US to do that. It wouldn't be the first time that we've done that. Uh, we have engaged with the people on the ground in a particular country uh, on the issues from human rights to democracy to, to uh, uh, where it, it doesn't stop us from criticizing uh, or pointing out something that we think is, is the wrong thing for the leader or the leadership of a nation to do. So we can, there's an expression here, and I don't know if it translates well, but we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And so um, I don't see that as a challenge, it, and it wouldn't be the first time, and it won't be the last time that we have to do that. Uh, we have this people-to-people -people, uh, engagement theme that underlines the so the, the themes about democracy and governance. Um, uh, you know, one of the jobs I had in the diplomatic corps was being the director of the Office of Public Diplomacy, uh, which uh, for the Africa region, each region of the world has issue within their geographic bureau. And so for the Africa Bureau, uh, I was the director for that office. And that's the office that, you know, helps oversee all of our engagement programs on the ground. And maybe that's why I talk about the, you know, the, the operationalizing of some of these things. So how do you go about uh, uh, helping somebody understand what democracy truly means? How do you, how do you turn that into a, a actionable program on the ground to help people that haven't had that experience understand the responsibility that comes with that experience? Uh, and so I, I think uh, we have an entire uh, bureau that does uh, we have an entire bureau uh, division for Africa and around the world that does that. And so, uh, you know, that's not something new for us to do. So I think that, um, you know, that will be uh, a lot of emphasis will be put there uh, and we can manage sort of the people to people engagement, even if we have to criticize or point out our challenges with a particular leader and or the governance that that leader is executing. Yes, because of course in the previous administration, the Trump one, I mean the U.S. was involved with leaders in Africa who were considered to be oppressive leaders by their citizens. I mean the likes of Museveni of Uganda, Paul Beer of Cameroon, leaders who were apparently not interested in improving governance or maintaining transparency in governments or improving human rights and development. And the Trump administration worked with them because they were cooperating in the fight against terrorism and religious extremism. But obviously, good governance is very important for a sustainable struggle against terrorism, isn't it? I think that, you know, if you look at the U.S. history in Africa, it, it has been storied. It has not always been uh, one that I'm proud of as an individual. Uh, one of the reasons why I when I joined the Foreign Service, I specifically wanted to work in the Africa Bureau because I did not like how our engagement was uh, with the continent. And over time, I've seen, you know, just a huge shift looking at Africa as a partner, uh, as a strategic partner as well. Uh, again, this idea that it's one size fits all, that you can't do 
uh, you know, several things in a country, you know, I don't subscribe to that. You know, yes, uh, we can have engagement uh, and help on assist on security because in the end, the security is the people on the day-to-day -day, uh, basis in a particular country. So yes, there's, to me anyway, that I don't have a conflict in my mind about engaging with, with a entity uh, or country or nation on security because in the end, it's about protecting the people on, on, on the ground. It doesn't mean, though, criticize and point out uh, where we see challenges with our values on democracy and governance. And I think that if you go back to, uh, this, you know, there, we have, we did make statements on, on the Ugandan elections. Uh, you know, Congress has made statements on uh, Ethiopia and so has the administration. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, one or the other. I mean, if you, you know, geopolitics, uh, when I teach classes, you know, or not, it's, it's not black and white. I mean, you've got to take everything that comes and you can't, it's not about doing one thing or the other per se, unless you're making sort of a decision about going to war or, or, I mean, that's probably the only one, but everything else you have to figure out how to engage and you engage on a multiplicity of levels, not just one. And sometimes they're contradictory and that's the nature of geopolitics. So I don't see that as a problem. It's not something new for us. Uh, we do that all the time. We may criticize uh, and point out on one end, but it doesn't mean that we may not then also help at the same time on something that still supports our values like helping on, uh, on, on terrorist conflicts uh, and uh, the growing uh, challenges with security in the Sahel and, and I've been watching Mozambique uh, very, very carefully, particularly the Cabo Delgado area because you have um, uh, an uptick there of, uh, of, of terrorism uh, in the way kind of similar to the nascent begin of the Boko Haram issue in, um, in northern Nigeria. I do pay attention to that quite, quite a lot. So, I mean, given all that, how do you think U.S. policy should advance with Africa in the frame? I mean, bearing in mind the disrespect or the perception of disrespect that people have from the Trump administration. One suggestion that's been made is that the new Vice President Kamala Harris should actually visit Africa to renew ties and bring about a new understanding. Very briefly, because we've got to take a break, what do you make of that suggestion? You know, I do believe that the Biden administration will, you know, determine, you know, what trips to make first when. I mean, that's that's the prerogative, certainly, of the, the office of the president. But I can't imagine that Africa would not be in that top tier. I just, I, I just would find that really, really uh, difficult to uh, imagine that Africa would not be front and center, you know. So that you highlighted at the top of your scenario here um, in terms of population, importance, growth, trade. You've got the AFCTA coming, uh, came on board uh, last month. Uh, you've got this tremendous uh, 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 energy on the continent, the emerging uh, uh, continent, even challenges. I always think about Africa as an emerging place and an energetic a dynamic place and so i think it's possible to to imagine right that in the first tier africa would be part of the trips that would be listed for someone senior in the administration right leader. okay uh we'll come back in a minute we're talking to ambassador uh robin renee sanders you're watching the arise interview plenty more still ahead stay with us
Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Enyagulu. So we now have a better idea of America's likely role in the world over the next four years. Joe Biden has given his first major speech on foreign policy, putting U.S. global leadership as the centerpiece of his international agenda and signaling a change in direction for the country. Moments after delivering that foreign policy speech, Mr. Biden promised to rebuild America's partnership with the African Union, which took a big hit under his predecessor Donald Trump, culminating in a row over Mr. Trump's alleged use of the word S-hole to decry describe African nations. So how different will the Biden administration's African policy be to that of President Trump's? Is Africa now fully back on the White House political agenda? Well, we spent a lot of time discussing that with my guest today, who was for several years the U.S. ambassador to Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the African Union, as well as ECOWAS, the West African regional body. She is, of course, Ambassador Robin Renee Sanders, and she's still with me from Washington. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And I, I want to take a bit of time to talk about beyond you know biden's policy and so on to africa on a personal level um your time here in nigeria because of course you are no longer in the u.s diplomatic service so perhaps you can afford not to take the diplomatic approach in your answers i mean having said that um i wonder if you might briefly assess for us the time you spent here in nigeria as u.s ambassador uh, pardon me, but we lost audio, so I did not hear the front end of your question. Okay, uh, but what I was saying basically is that you, you are, of course, no longer in the U.S. diplomatic service, so perhaps you can afford not to take the diplomatic approach in answering this question that I'm going to ask you, which is um for you to briefly assess for us the time you spent here in nigeria as u.s ambassador yeah, you know nigeria is uh you know really one of my uh favorite places i spent a lot of time there even since i've left nigeria in my official capacity and it was an interesting transition period for nigeria when i was there it was a, a period of time where uh, you had a president uh, that just six months um, uh, in a hospital in Saudi Arabia uh, and passing away in office. You had a constitutional crisis uh, where you did not have in your previous constitution uh, a clear transition uh, to an acting president. Uh, if something happened to the head of state, uh, you had uh, the, uh, the rise of, uh, of, of Boko Haram in the Northeast. Uh, at the same time, you were still having uh, conflict uh, in the Niger Delta. Uh, but that being said, um, it was um, uh, a very personally engaging uh, there in Nigeria, uh, not just on those political and governance and um, uh, development issues that we've talked about before, but also being an advocate for Nigeria. I think that um, if uh, anything came out of that tour for me uh, was a kid for Nigeria uh, whenever I could be and I've still done that because sometimes unfortunately and it's something that I find extremely annoying is that uh, the entire country gets uh, painted with one brush uh, in terms of, of you know some of the negative things going on but no one here in the U.S. about all the, the, the positive things about the people of Nigeria. Uh, you know, clearly you've had NSARS, NSARS recently and you still have the development challenges and now we all have COVID to grapple with. But uh, there's, a, there's an energy and a, a respect that I have for the Nigerian people. Uh, in the Republic of Congo, I was ambassador to the Republic of Congo and not to the Democratic Republic of Congo. I uh, just, uh, you know, I want to make sure that no one comes back and says, you know, you were a DRC ambassador. I was not. I was ambassador to the, to the, to the Republic of Congo. And so, you, you know, if you really care about the country that you're serving in, and those are the things that you think about. Uh, you try to deal with the challenges, but you also learn about the culture and the people. And uh, I've been committed to that, uh, you know, throughout my tour, Sudan, 
Republic of Congo uh, and certainly in Nigeria. And I still to this day uh, remain an advocate for Nigeria because as I said, there's a tendency to paint uh, the, the entire country with one brush and that's just not true. I also want to congratulate Nigeria because you have just nominated your first uh, American sorry, pardon me, first uh, woman uh, to come to the U.S. Uh, to serve as your foot here. And uh, that was wonderful news for all of us that care and love Nigeria. And we look forward, despite the COVID environment, to being supportive uh, to her efforts here to strengthen U.S.-Nigeria relationships. So congratulations to, to Nigeria for uh, uh, nominating it, its first woman. So today, uh, I hear that uh, the South Korean um, candidate for the WTO has stepped out and, um, uh, and that uh, uh, the former fi finance minister is now the sole candidate. And last week, uh, I signed on with a number of other uh, prominent American support for um, uh, Ngozi uh, to be the WTO secretary general. So you've got a lot of wonderful things going on and we look forward to working with Nigeria as partners on some of the challenges that that were there when I was there but are still persisting now and certainly the the, uh, the uh, I guess the end game that came out of the NSAR is what happens next how are the human rights issues that that were signaled in that how are they addressed going forward I mean so there are some societal challenges that that you have to address uh you know certainly uh position at all to to uh highlight that over highlighting our own societal challenges because we are truly a divided nation at this time and so uh i do think there's some synergy that we can have together uh not just on the challenges but certainly on the positives Right, okay. Well, let, let's switch gears. Uh, we're, we're coming to the dying minutes of, of the interview. Let's switch gears and talk more anecdotally about your time here. What is it about Nigeria that you liked the most and what is it that you hated the most? Um, you know, I don't use the term at all. Um, you know, I started my career in Sudan, so pretty much nothing bothers me uh, uh, across the board. But the vibrancy of the of the people that I had the honor to engage with, the the culture, the uh, the art. Uh, you know, I traveled uh, throughout Nigeria, maybe going to each and every state uh, two the, two to three times uh, during my time there. So I felt like I really had a good sense of not just the nation national character overall, but the smallest vi village in Dikwa in in, in Borno State or you know, uh, border villages, uh, you know, a Nigerian border or uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Cameroonian border with Nigeria. Uh, so traveling extensively throughout Nigeria uh, to every state and every village I could possibly get to gave me a good sense. Uh, I saw uh, on, your, uh, on your board there that you showed a picture of me standing to uh, large pieces of art. And that is, uh, those pieces were done by a Nigerian artist, uh, Nikki uh, Davis Okandanye. And uh, she, uh, to me, you know, is reflective of the creative spirit, whether it's in textiles or paintings and all of that. And it, were, it was two pieces that, that uh, the Smithsonian Institution uh, Museum here, which is, you know, one of the world famous museums here. And so, uh, you know, just really having a sense of what it was like to be in a range of Nigerian villages, to engage with uh, villagers and farmers and, uh, you know, small businesses across the board being engaged on the cultural side from, you know, art, uh, from textiles across the board. So I really felt like I, I um, you know, Nigeria was my second home. And to, okay. this, to this day, I call Nigeria my second home. Ambassador Robin Renee Sanders, I want to thank you very much indeed for the time that you've given us. Ambassador Robin Renee Sanders was talking to me from Washington. That's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and Washington. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.